Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Black Tower Show. I'm your host, Nathan Ford, joined here by Jake Fox. How you doing? We're broadcasting 1590 AM WASB, Brockport, Rochester. 1310 AM WRSB, Canandaigua, Rochester. If you'd like to call in and talk to me or Jake, the number's 585-637-7040. Right off the bat, I'd like to thank our sponsors for the show. If it wasn't for these people, our show wouldn't be possible. We have Galleria Pizza. They're 16 East Main Street, Rochester, New York. 18 years operating downtown Galleria Pizza inside the Reynolds Arcade. Me and Jake just went down there the other day. We got some great food. Proud sponsors of the Black Tower Show, Galleria Pizza. Our guest today on the Black Tower Show, on the first hour, is Timothy Noah, American journalist. He's a senior editor of The New Republic, where he writes the TRB column. Noah is also a contributing editor to Washington Monthly and frequent commentator on CBS News Sunday morning. He wrote a book. Um, and we had him on the show, uh, well, geez, it was about six months ago. He has a book, uh, The Great Divergence, America's Growing Inequality Crisis and What We Can Do About It. And he's really mapped out the fact that since 1979, what he sees is uh, the rich keep getting richer, the 1%, and the poor maintain kind of a steady, slow decline. And he says that this matters. It matters for two reasons. It matters because economically we need to incentivize the workforce. We need, uh, as the workers grow with their company, they need to have incentive. They need to get a little bit back. And what he makes the argument is that the workers are not getting back what they justly deserve. And then also the sociological argument that the rich culture and that and those of the working class have been separated and are no longer kind of contributing or sharing ideas anymore. So if you think about it, like, the cool kids at school are hanging out behind the dumpster while everybody else has is confined to the cafeteria or something. So you have a separation so that there's not sharing of ideas. So he talks about a sociological phenomenon as well. So Timothy Noah, our guest on the Black Tower Show. If you'd like to call in again, it's 585-637-7040. Joined by Mr. Jake Fox. How you doing over there? Good. I'm doing great. Uh, this great divergence he speaks of in his latest book, uh, the great divergence, that term was actually coined by uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman, where he where they des- they describe a situation where, like Nate said, the poor are getting poorer and the rich are getting richer. And you're seeing... A situation where one-third of Americans depend on the government for income in some way or another through disability, right. Social Security, welfare, food stamps, whatever. We, I mean, really, we live in a nanny state, but um, without the nanny state rhetoric uh, that mm. a lot of European nations have. So our guest, Timothy Noah, is going to be calling into the show and just... A few moments. Talk about, we had Chris Hedges uh, recently on the show. We talked about Immokalee, Florida, Camden, New Jersey, these cities that, uh, as Hedges calls them, sacrifice zones, where literally the wealth and everything has been sucked out of the community. Looks like we do have a caller online, too. So without further ado, we do have Timothy Noah on the show. Thank you for being on the Black Tower Show, Timothy Noah. Thank you so much for having me. American journalist, senior editor of The New Republic. He writes the TRB column. Noah is also contributing editor to The Washington Monthly and a frequent commentator on CBS News' uh, Sunday morning. We talked about why economic inequality matters. Can you run us through the kind of two branches of thought behind that question, the answer to that question? Yes, well, I should sort of kind of start off by saying this is not a question people used to used to ask a uh, hundred years ago because a hundred years ago uh, the uh, ruling elites were terrified that there would be a violent overthrow of the United States government by anarchists and socialists and uh, all sorts of people. So uh, they they never uh, dared ask the question why should we care about income inequality and 
it also wasn't asked 50 years ago because uh, the U.S. was in a Cold War uh, with the Soviet Union and competing for hearts and minds abroad. Um, so the question hasn't even really come up until pretty recently, um, you know, now that communism is dead and, and there is very little uh, likelihood of, uh, of a revolution in the United States. And, and as you say, I, I do have two reasons. One is economic, and that is that we need to incentivize people, uh, uh, not just at the top, not just the job creators that Republicans like to talk about, but also people at the middle, uh, people uh, earning median income, um, ha- have not gotten a raise in about a dozen years. In fact, median income has, has gone down during that period, while at the same time, productivity has, has gone up. Um, that's a, it seems to me that's an economically dangerous situation. If people uh, in the middle class uh, don't uh, see any return on their productivity, um, their, their contribution to uh, economic wealth, then what reason do they have to care whether their company prospers or whether whether their country prospers? Is that alienation of people from their work? Is that the is that what's what's happening there? Well, I th- I would say it's 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 likely to happen certainly, and yes, I think you could argue that it's already happening. Mm. That, um, that we're already seeing a pretty dispirited working class in this country, um, and. Uh, and that you can, um, uh, you know, you can connect that to all sorts of uh, uh, behaviors by by people at the middle, um, uh, right. kind of uh, um, out of wedlock uh, births, uh, um, uh, people, um, uh, you know, sort of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, all sorts of uh, things. Um, right. You know, now whether it, it, it truly is happening now, whether we're getting a glimpse of what could happen. I couldn't tell you, but it does seem to me that over the long term, that is a very dangerous situation economically because people have to feel that their effort is going to be rewarded. Um, so that's the economic reason. The sociological reason is, um, you know, simply that uh, our our politics uh, are becoming increasingly tribal, and I think that's that is clearly happening already. Mm. Um, there's much less of a sense of e pluribus unum in the country, uh, a much greater sense of alienation um, mm. between um, uh, the middle class and, uh, and the affluent. Um, and, uh, you know, ironically, this has been documented to a great extent by a conservative writer, mm. Charles Murray, in his recent book, um, Coming Apart, uh, where he documents all sorts of ways that, that the culture of the working class and the culture of the um, affluent, uh, mm. how those two cultures have, have grown apart. My only difference with Murray would be that he, he refuses to recognize that this is being driven by uh, economic conditions. It makes me think of Nietzsche when he talks about master-slave politics. It, is it that poor people in this country are being demonized and then sort of put into a political dichotomy, you know, being pushed into this dichotomy so that, well, if you're this... If you have this certain label, you know, liberal, conservative, whatever, then you have this set of traits. And I think, is that what's happening? Because that's a dangerous road to be going down. Well, I, I don't say, I mean, inequality is really a, a phenomenon that uh, something, that something occurs between the middle and, and the top. Uh, I mean, obviously, there is inequality, inequality between the bottom and the middle mm. uh, as well. But that uh, income inequality has not been growing appreciably. Uh, over the last 30 years, where we've seen the big growth in income inequality is between the middle and the top. But, uh, you know, I think we, uh, I would certainly agree that, yeah, there, there's a lot of stereotyping, there's a lot of demonization, there's a lot of kind of mutual misunderstanding um, between uh, the working class and the affluent. Uh, you know, last, uh, uh, last year we, we, we heard a lot about how Republicans wanted to make as a condition of collecting unemployment insurance uh... they wanted to uh... they wanted workers to be able to demonstrate that either they had a high school degree or they were working towards a high school degree and were making good progress now i'm i'm as in favor as as anybody else of of education but to make it a condition of collecting unemployment is is almost to say that 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 you don't deserve unemployment benefits 
if 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 you didn't go to high school, uh, which is um, you know uh, that's nuts, and 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 it's a kind of a it sort of dehumanizes uh, those who have been paying into the unemployment system for years yeah. and who need to collect it. This debate, you know, this debate seems so heated right now. I have, I'm approached by so many people that feel on one hand that if we cut welfare that in a sense that's just killing off you know uh weeding out those are that are the less you know the least fortunate and yet i I feel people's strong opinions on people are taking advantage of this welfare system and we really need to work this out and finding that compromise and that balance between the two it just seems like such a tricky uh it's a very difficult thing to do i mean uh, how well, it feels it feels unappeasable to me. I mean, the the when you're talking about welfare, you you you, you know, it's 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 absurd to to talk about uh, uh, the abuse of welfare when when you know the 1996 law, um, as as Bill Clinton said, ended welfare as we knew it. Um, you know, mm-hmm. arguably there were uh, there were some bad incentives built into the system previously. Although I always thought they were exaggerated. But certainly, the idea that people are abusing the welfare system now is is absurd. I mean, we, we have a we have you know kind of time limits on welfare. We have uh, a mandatory work requirement. Uh, mm-hmm. There was a big hue and cry by Republicans when the Obama administration uh, you know uh, signaled that it would be willing to consider alternative means of meeting the work requirement, and yeah. and you know Republicans immediately demonized that as gutting the work requirement, which is preposterous. And there was no recognition in the middle of this debate that you know, we've seen a huge increase in unemployment in this country in the last few years. And um, uh, this is no time to be lecturing people uh, on their inability to get a job, not when unemployment is above 8%. This is the moment when we need to be expanding welfare roles to to um, take into account the fact that a job has gotten much more difficult to acquire. Either that or, um, uh, you know, creating jobs programs, giving people jobs. I'd be all for that. And that was part of the initial welfare reform discussion. But, of course, it got shunted aside uh, because uh, uh, the, um, the political support was for something much more punitive than that. Um, right. uh, but, you know, yes, this... this, this uh, this kind of reaching for old, you know, kind of old um, uh, 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 scapegoats, and it seems to me crazy. It, it just doesn't recognize what the contemporary reality is. We have right. so many few, fewer people on welfare today than we did in 1996, and, and, and in all likelihood, we, we should have more because of the condition of the economy. Um, yeah. But but you know the the, the system wasn't wasn't uh, was supposed to be set up actually to accommodate that, but somehow it it didn't. I know on a personal level, it, debating and talking about these things with you know my close friends is they have real passion about the welfare state and people uh, abusing the system. It it's very difficult to talk to people about this certain thing because it brings up you know pull yourself up by your bootstraps this American way of thinking that. It's very hard to get people to listen and sort of accept what I believe is the truth, and I tend to agree with you. And that is, but are we focused on this while places like Immokalee, Florida, we had Chris Hedges on the show, Camden, New Jersey, these places, these sacrifice zones, essentially, where the communities, I mean, these are the most poor people in the U.S. They're living, you know, in these trailers with one mattress and 12 people, and they, they're, it's, I mean, these places are, sacrifice zones literally what Hedges is talking about meanwhile we're focused on this idea of the welfare state etc but this is still going on these towns are decimated literally sucking the resources out of it leaving the people there uh just completely penniless i mean that's happening right well this this notion of you know the deserving poor you know uh 25 years ago uh the the prevailing orthodoxy uh, among conservatives was that you had the deserving poor and you had the undeserving poor. The, the, the undeserving poor were on welfare. The deserving poor were poor people who, who had a job. And um, the, the idea was, well, we should reward people who have a job. 
So uh, we saw under Ronald Reagan uh, an expansion of the earned income tax credit continued under Bill Clinton. And, um, uh, you know, th- th- there, was, there was some room for, for um, uh, uh, you know, compassion for, for, for simply wanting to help people who were, um, you know, playing by the rules, as Bill Clinton used to say. And today... Uh, there are no, in the conservative mind, I think there are no uh, deserving poor anymore. You are, in deserving, you are undeserving simply by virtue of being poor, even if you're working. Uh, and consequently, um, since there's not much of a welfare program to demonize anymore, mm. we're hearing demonization of food stamps, which used to win support from conservatives because it was a very targeted kind of support. You could only use them, uh, food stamps, to buy food. You couldn't use them to waste money on anything. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, uh, and you're seeing demonization of unemployment benefits, which is, um, you know, unbelievable to me. Uh, mm-hmm. There's, um, uh, there is, and you're, and you're seeing calls to eliminate the earned income tax credit. Uh, that's sort of uh, being done more subtly, but when conservatives talk about broadening the tax base as part of tax reform, what they mean is uh, putting onto the tax rolls people who have been removed from the tax rolls uh, quite deliberately um, over the last uh, 30 years or so because it was recognized that they didn't earn enough money to have to pay income taxes. Right. And um, mm. so, you know, it's... it's, it's, um, it's this, 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 this limited. We used to see some limited uh, respect for the poor. Now it seems to me we're, you know, <coughs> among conservatives, seeing none at all. Our guest on the Black Tower Show, Timothy Noah, is an American journalist. He's a senior. He's the senior editor of the New Republic, where he writes the TRB column. Noah is also contributing editor to the Washington Monthly and a frequent commentator on CBS News's Sunday Morning. We're broadcasting 15:90 a.m. WASB. 1310 AM WRSB, Rochester, New York, upstate New York. If you'd like to call in, 585-637-7040. And I'm joined by Jake Fox. Hey, uh, Tim. This um, this situation with um, this demonization of food stamps, um, unemployment insurance, all of that, it, it really, it's getting to a point where this could become a national security issue. Um, you have uh, one third of uh, Americans on some sort of government assistance, and that includes middle class people, where where you describe the great divergence happening there. Um, that includes food stamps, unemployment, um, disability, uh, welfare, whatever. Um, if we get a uh, conservative dominating uh, government that's really itching to get austerity going in this country, we, we could really see a level of, I believe, social unrest. W- w- what do you think about that? Well, you know, it's hard to say. I think it's, it's uh, uh, I'm always very careful about predicting, you know, social un- unrest as a result of um, uh, uh, anti-poor policies because it, it never seems to have uh, arisen in the past. Um, you know, the last time we really saw it was the 1930s. And um, mm. so, so uh, you know, I, I don't know what the breaking point is. We, we, I, I was a little stunned uh, a couple days ago listening to NPR, and I uh, heard a report uh, talking about a guy who was unemployed, who was um, uh, collecting some food from his local church. And he was interviewed, and he said um, it was okay. He was he was fine with accepting private charity, but he would never ever accept a government check because that is socialism, and private charity is is okay. And and you know there is that mentality even among some of the recipients of mm. um, of uh, of assistance in this country. Um, so you know I think you know part of what's really poisonous about um, uh, economic downturns in a in a meritocratic society is the kind of uh, self-loathing that it encourages um, among those who don't prosper. Uh, it's not something people talk about very much, but you know, um, you know, we're we're all in favor of an economy based on merit. But it, it has some 
uh, it has some very, very unattractive sides that, that we, need to, uh, we need to take into account. And people need to uh, understand that, um, that uh, if, if they are out of work, um, you know, that, that, that isn't, you know, uh, a reason, that, you know, to, to, to blame themselves. Right. Let's get to this uh, issue of uh, QE Forever that uh, Bernanke announced a couple days ago. The uh, Federal Reserve is going to buy $40 billion of U.S. debt every month uh, for the foreseeable, foreseeable future. Um, no, one, no one in the government is really talking like this is a dire situation, but this is a dire signal. What, 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 uh, what's going on here? Why, why are they doing this? Well, I, I, I think it's a. Uh, I think they're responding to dire circumstances. I think it's a hopeful signal that they're finally doing something, and they they should have done it a long time ago. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, Paul Krugman, who's who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, says he thinks we're in a depression, um, which you know he he says is strictly defined as as. Um, uh, uh, not a really bad recession, which is probably what a lot of us tend to think of it as, mm. but rather as a um, a period when there are recessions and there are recoveries, but the economy never really recovers very far. Uh, and um, uh, you know that that might be the circumstance we're in. And 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 you know Krugman says this is a if it is a depression, it is a depression that we are fully capable of getting ourselves out of with the proper amount of um, government stimulus. And he's, been, he's certainly been after the Fed hmm. to uh, get off the dime for a long time, and it was a little puzzling that the Fed was being so timid about this. Uh, the Fed is, uh, I, I gather, um, really divided uh, these days, although the, the, the vote for this particular move was uh, 11 to 1. But, but hmm. um, uh, you know, it's certainly a sign that things are bad. It's not going to be enough. There's going to have to be... Uh, more action um, hmm. from the government, and um, I, I just uh, wrote a TRB column for the New Republic coming out next week, where I sort of argue that I kind of walk through what I think Romney would do if he were elected president, and I think the 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 sum total of what he would do would be to put the country back in recession, um, because you know when you think about it, what has he said he would do? Well, he says he'll he'll uh, he'll cut taxes. Hmm. Um, uh, he'll he'll extend the uh, the Bush tax cuts for everybody, not just people, uh, not just incomes under two hundred fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. That will provide some small amount of stimulus, but not very much, because rich people, um, you know, aren't going to use that money to step up their consumption, which is what the economy really needs. You know, maybe he can get uh, an additional tax cut through, probably again uh, heavily weighted. To the affluent, I don't think he's going to get anything close to the tax plan uh, he's he's advocating in the campaign, just because the, the numbers are so preposterous. Uh, but so let's say he gets a little more stimulus uh, added to extending the Bush tax cuts. Okay, that's a little more stimulus. Uh, Richard Freeman told me it would mostly be stimulus for the Cayman Islands, but let's give him that. He'd give us a little more stimulus. Well, that would be completely wiped out by the monetary policy. That, that Romney advocates, which is very tight money. He, he disapproves of, of this latest move by Bernanke. Um, he would not reappoint Bernanke. Even if he relented and did reappoint Bernanke, we can assume that, he would, uh, uh, that, 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 that Bernanke would be um, uh, 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 constrained uh, during, under a Romney presidency. And uh, so we would see a lot less monetary stimulus there. Um, and uh, meanwhile, we would see Romney absolutely slicing away at the federal government, which would, uh, uh, you know, uh, be uh, a serious drag on the economy. Um, mm. You know, he wants to cut about six hundred billion dollars out of the uh, out of the federal budget, which is ludicrous. But let's say he got half of that. I mean, that would uh, that would uh, surely send us right into a recession. And that's before we even discuss the fact that Romney doesn't want to do anything about the central problem that's plaguing the economy, which is the, um, uh, the, the, the debt overhang from the mortgage crisis. Uh, you know, the Obama, um, the Obama administration has an inadequate response to that. It's gotten a little better over the last year. Romney, until pretty recently, said he didn't want to do anything about that. Now he's saying 
in a in a sort of very vague way, well, yes, we should do something. But I think probably we saw his truer self when he said he didn't want to do anything about it, particularly since there's a lot of resistance uh, on Capitol Hill to doing anything. Romney wouldn't do anything about uh, 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 in a growing income inequality. Uh, he wouldn't do anything about the deficit because he would always put tax cuts before deficit reduction. Uh, you know, the guy would be a disaster for the economy. We, there are solutions on the table that are out there for us to uh, not have to go through this ridiculous austerity. New York, for example, has a tax on Wall Street on the books, and they're talking about closing schools, cutting services here, all of this kind of stuff. The Federal Reserve doesn't lend for manufacturing or any real tangible economic growth. They're, they're lending for these bizarre financial gambling instruments. Um, what, uh, what, what, what's stopping uh, the Fed, uh, New York State, from uh, really, really getting in here and trying to tackle the problem? The Fed could um, issue century bonds to the states for zero percent uh, on zero percent interest, uh, create infrastructure projects like the Tennessee Valley Authority or or something like that. What, what's preventing us from really trying to solve the problem? Do you think? Well, I wouldn't look to the Fed for that kind of stimulus. They may have the power to do it, but I think politically they're very unlikely to do it. I, I would look to, to Congress for that. And, and you mentioned Wall Street and the need to regulate Wall Street. I think that's an area that's actually uh, – where, where, where there is some possibility there. You know, Congress, certainly Republicans in Congress and, and Mitt Romney are dead set against uh, even the, the, the you know, relatively minor regulations that have been uh, that are in the process of being put in place under Dodd Frank, but um, you know when you look at what the public public opinion is, even among even among very conservative Republicans, um, we're hearing a lot about the need to change the way Wall Street does business. I'm struck by the fact that I, I keep seeing uh, articles appear in places like the Wall Street Journal editorial page, the Weekly Standard, um, you know, conservative publications where, where um, economic writers are saying we need to break up the big banks. Um, so mm-hmm. I think that uh, I think that, that congressional Republicans are behind the curve here. They're probably uh, their their motivation is probably that they want to try and lure. Wall Street dollars away from Democrats, but you know if 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 uh, if the tide of public opinion is really turning as it seems to be, and it's not just um, liberals and it's not just Democrats, then you know we might we might see a real push towards uh, greater regulation of Wall Street, and and that would um, you know it, you know it wouldn't necessarily help us out of this economic slump, but it might help prevent the next one. Timothy No, our guest on the Black Tower Show. We're broadcasting 1590 AM WASB, 1310 AM WRSB. If you'd like to call in, the number is 585-637-7040. You're listening to the Black Tower Show. How much of this is Glass-Steagall? Can we talk a lot about the sh- on the show about Glass-Steagall, about um, what banks are able to do? Um, how much of our current problem has to do with doing away with Glass-Steagall, in your opinion? Well, I don't think Glass-Steagall had... I don't think that the uh, 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 doing away with Glass-Steagall had much to do with the 2008 crisis. Um, uh, but it's, it, it is... It, I think it, it, it has a symbolic importance, which is it's, it's, it's a concrete example of a million different forms of deregulation that that have taken place over the last 30 years that have had the aggregate effect of uh, loosening the reins on Wall Street. My, my uh, main concern with Glass-Steagall going forward is that it encourages bank consolidation, which I think is the last thing we need now. I think we need to um, make sure that banks don't get to be too big to fail. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but I think that, that it's, it, Glass-Steagall was more a symptom than a cause of the um, uh, of the uh, 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 kind of deregulatory fever that uh, that has overtaken uh, 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 Washington uh, over the last generation. It did make the situation a lot worse, though, by giving them access to all those customer funds to gamble with, right? 
well, you know, in theory, it did. I, 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 I'm not a great expert on this. My, my sense is that, uh, that uh, when you take a close look, um, Glass-Eagle per se did not play a, a great role in, in creating the 2008 hmm. uh, crisis. The firms that, uh, that, that went under um, were, were not, uh, tended not to be excuse me, firms that had um, taken great advantage of, uh, of Glass-Steagall. Um, but, yeah. um, uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, the larger problem was, you know, there were no limits on things like leverage. Um, there was a you know, socialization of risk uh, uh, mm-hmm. so that um, uh, you didn't, uh, there was no downside to, to taking large risk large risks which earned people on Wall Street a great deal of money um, but um, were risky and, 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 and put the economy in, in peril. Um, so, you know, I think probably we should repeal Glass-Steagall, but I would not blame 2008 on right. Glass-Steagall. I guess on the Black Shower Show, Timothy Noah, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today, and we'd love to have you back on the show again in the future. Thank you so much. You take care now. Thank you.